Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Allie, your KS Wild community organizer. I'm calling in from the unceded ancestral lands of the native tribes of the Tacoma people that is now called Grants Pass, Oregon. They are not only important parts of the history of this place, but in its future and continuing knowledge of this place. So if you don't know whose land you're on right now, wherever you are zooming in from, go find out. Educate yourself with the place you live and the work that those tribal nations are advocating for. Other ways you can support tribal peoples is to make a donation to your local tribal nations. And a good place to start is by checking out the Indigenous resource page on the KS Wild website. I already put that link in the chat box, so check it out when you have some time. Since I can't see any of your faces, for those of you who are with us right now, please navigate to the chat box and let us know where you are calling in from. It's just fun to see where everyone is zooming in from tonight. Hi, Elisa from Medford. Glad you're with us tonight. All right, we're getting lots of folks. Grants pass. Welcome, Joe. Glad you guys are here with us tonight. Thank you. So we have a great presentation in store for you tonight titled Why Serpentine Rocks? This is part two of two. And tonight we are in store for a great presentation by John Roth titled Serpentine Surprising Side Trips. But before we get started, I have a few announcements. The Love Where You Live webinar series is produced by KS Wild. We are an environmental nonprofit working to protect and restore wild nature in the plants you region. We promote science-based land and water conservation through policy and community action, which is all of you. So thank you for being with us tonight and for your support to protect the Klamath Siskiyou region. With that, I wanna let everyone know that tonight's session will be recorded and we have closed captioning available as well. So if you're not seeing that on the bottom of your screen, go ahead and click those three dots that say more and you can enable the live transcripts. We have also saved time at the end for a short Q&A session. So if you have any questions now or throughout the presentation, click on that Q&A button and you can type your question in there. That helps me keep track of all the questions. Now, get comfy, sit back with your favorite beverage, and I hope you all enjoy tonight's presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, John Roth, who is an author and retired Oregon Caves National Monument Resource Specialist. John received an MS in cave geology in 1965. He spent the next 10 years working across the US in six parks from Alaska to the Everglades before becoming a ranger at Carlsberg Caverns. Carlsbad Caverns, excuse me. In 1989, he moved to Cave Junction and worked at Oregon Caves National Monument until retiring a year ago. He has written American Elves and the Klamath Siskiyou and Timely Treasures of an Iconic Bioregion, which is a great book, by the way, and is currently writing about regional and park geology and an encyclopedia of cave lore. I'm so honored to introduce to you all tonight, John Roth. And from here, go ahead and take it away, John. Thank you, Ali. Let me get your PowerPoint up here. Let 
There we go. Okay, I'm um, not quite uh, there. Um, I'm in Zoom United. Uh, let's see, okay, there we are. Sorry. Um, so, um, a little bit about why we have so many serpentine plants here has to do with size, the amount of serpentine, and its age are probably the two biggest things because uh, as well as habitat diversity, uh, it keeps extinction low, migration high, not too big, not too small. That's why we call it the Goldilocks uh, serpentine. Next. Oh, by the way, we can see uh, the, back up just a bit, uh, you can see the serpentine green outline, uh, outlines the, uh, the climate issues pretty well. Uh, and 14% uh, uh, or so more than most any other place on the planet. And that's the biggest part of probably why we have so many uh, serpentine plants. Next. Um, and why we have so many serpentine plants has also to do with the lack of competition uh, on serpentine areas where in serpentine, you have calcium magnesium ratios that are toxic to plants, prevents them from dividing cells as well as producing pectin which strengthens the roots. Next, the end result of that is that we have um, um, uh, disrupt cell division and also lactopectin stunts the roots in thin soils, which can't hold much water due to lack of organics or clay. So um, the good part of this though, actually is that stress increased in mutations uh, in plants that can withstand uh, those stresses uh, and, and more. And so, one, for example, mutation can disable a way to expel excess calcium, which is normally in excess in most plants. So if you can disable that uh, process, that uh, system, uh, you can uh, decrease your uh, magnesium to calcium ratio and therefore be able to produce pectin and other substances. So little geology, of course, because that's where serpentine comes from, is uh, an older but bolder coastal stretch, meaning that you have to have stretching of uh, rock plates as well as uh, boulders from serpentinite, one of the types of serpentine uh, mineral rocks. And uh, that uh, ends up uh, 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 producing lots of serpentine, but it also has to be buoyed up by crustal thickening from collisions, of which we've had more here than almost anywhere else on the planet. Next. Um, so we don't know for sure, geologists don't know for sure exactly why so many ophiolites or these ocean floors have grown here, uh, but it, one thing is being out in front, uh, just to luck of the draw perhaps, may have allowed a younger seafloor to slip under, tilt rock layers less, lift up more prototype than sister ranges. For example, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nevada mountains are um, uh, almost tilted completely upright and we are much more slanted. Uh, and so we have a greater exposure to serpentine much more than, um, than the uh, Sierra Nevadas. And also it's wider. And so it has a greater diversity of climates, much more than uh, the, the uh, Sierra Nevadas. As a consequence, we have many more serpentine endemics than the Sierra Nevadas or uh, other sister mountains like the uh, Blue Mountains that do. Uh, stretching out the rock uh, allows rock to melt and form these uh, seafloors composed of at the lower part, these uh, serpentinites and uh, pritatites, what we call ultramafics, meaning uh, high in magnesium and iron. So uh, one of the uh, other things that increases diversity is we have a greater evenness of the different rock types, uh, more percentage of pritatite in Josephine than most other ophiolites. And um, that's important because uh, as we'll see, the peridotite actually hosts more different types of plants than does the serpentinite simply because there's greater shelter among the boulders, run, water runoff, and so on. 
So summarization also expels even more calcite, resulting in a harsher environment than the pyridotite does. Uh, another thing that has saved the uh, Josephine pyridotite, which is one of our biggest, our second biggest one uh, uh, of these uh, seafloors, is uh, low density windblown silts actually from the end Permian times or the, the aftermath when most of the continents were denuded of, of uh, life because of extreme climate. And as a result, the silts were less dense and they helped prop up or buoy up the, uh, uh, the, the dense pyridotite, which is one of the densest rocks in the world. Next. Uh, and this is a good example a picture a painting of why the uh, pyridotite has a higher diversity because it shelters different plants uh, and um, hides them from desiccating from the sun, as well as allowing more water runoff to run off the rocks into the crevices and cracks in between where the plants grow. As a consequence, there's many more uh, individuals, at least, of uh, plants in the uh, uh, pyridotite versus the, uh, the, uh, the more uh, loosely eroded, easily eroded uh, serp uh, uh, serpentinite. Next. Uh, cliffs are a big feature of the Klamath Siskiyous because we're both a young and an old mountain system. We're very old, but also we've had recent uplifts. The end result is diversity has resulted from both types, flat areas, like uh, the area at O'Brien, the laterites there, the uh, tropical soils, uh, and also the more recent uh, uplift just within the last million years or two, uh, producing the high siskiyous. The end result is cliffs, which have their own uh, internal uh, habitat diversity. Uh, so maybe in Mount Preston, uh, the part of the high siskiyous uplifts produce only hybrids of, between different species, but Mount Eddy, a much likely a much older and flatter top mountain that's been uplifted from probably from sea level, uh, has a, a whole series of different um, uh, plants uh, centered there or sometimes just exclusively found on Mount Eddy, uh, like the Mount Eddy sky pilot. So within the uh, climate systems, of course, we have uh, centers, hotspots within the hotspot uh, in terms of serpentine endemics only found here. And Illinois Valley takes the cake in terms of number of endemics. Why so? Again, it has to do with Goldilocks uh, serpentinite, meaning that we're not too much rain, uh, which like on the coast would produce too much competition with grasses and so fewer endemics and not too dry, which would cause extinction or extirpation uh, further to the east as it does. So right here again, in the terms of climate, as well as being at the north end of our range, uh, uh, range limit uh, results in um, considerable diversity and some plants so recent that they simply have not had a chance to move out of the valley into other serpentine areas. So we're the U.S. Uh, West uh, oldest exposed serpentinite, serpentine and uh, uh, serpentinite of great aerial extent. And so the age and the extent is the, the most important parameters in terms of, of um, uh, producing more endemics, as well as the extended uh, climate diversity and the internal diversity between the different types of serpentine uh, landscapes, the fens, the dry serp serpentinite and the dry apridotite. Uh, related to these range limits, being at the limit of your range, especially in this case to the north, uh, is more likely to become separated from neighbors and produce mutations and not swamped by interbreeding with a larger population. And in fact, most uh, a lot of uh, serpentine plants are produced by uh, what we call ecological speciation in which 
the plant rejects, uh, does not fertilize uh, uh, seeds or produce fertilization or aborts seeds if the pollen comes from outside of the suburban area from the same species, but less adapted uh, genetically to the serpentine. And that's on well on its way to producing new species uh, through hybrids uh, and producing, ultimately producing endemics, uh, either just found in serpentine or found in the climate tissues only or both. So uh, not only does it produce endemics, but also it may be producing new endemics eventually by extending the range. Once again, if these populations become isolated from climate uh, uh, extremes, uh, decade-long drought, for example, that we're experiencing right now appears, then uh, the isolated population are more likely to mutate uh, and produce new species. So even though these are not endemic to the climate ciscues, uh, some of them could be on their way to becoming new species uh, as the climate changes. So again, more species that are simply um, extending their extending the range further uh, north uh, because of less competition, because the serpentine makes it a drier, similar to what's happening to the south of us. One thing to point out is that this uh, whole uh, topic is on uh, not just serpentine ecology, because we have to consider uh, uh, evolution as well, uh, ecological speciation, as it's called, uh, especially here. Uh, of course, science has for a long time emphasized just the ecology of serpentine, the horizontal extent, but uh, now scientists, as well as indigenous cultures for a long time ago, uh, have now emphasized or have emphasized the, uh, the vertical extent, i.e. the, ecology, the uh, evolution, uh, the depth going down into the symbionts, the fungi, uh, et cetera, underground. But both are important evolution and, and ecology or understanding um, adaptations. Um, some of them are pretty simple, tiny dissected or thick leaves uh, to reduce evaporation, similar to uh, the old Volkswagen wet uh, uh, engine that was air cooled. Uh, by having tiny leaves, you're more likely to cool your leaves to the right temperature without sacrificing precious water, as these uh, plants illustrate. Hairs uh, not only to shade the plant, but also to lessen wind uh, by breaking up the air currents, uh, the laminar flow into uh, vortexes, uh, it reduces the amount of evaporation that occurs uh, on the plant. And so some of the plants that are uh, serpentine uh, versus their non-serpentine uh, cousins, for example, and probably ancestors such as dwarf soap tassel are hairy underneath in the leaves, but not the uh, the original ancestor. By the way, uh, uh, silk tassel may have actually developed within the Klamasiskis. Again, leaves close to the ground to reduce evaporation. Uh, the uh, Klamath Mountain catchfly, by the way, is one of the few coastal uh, endemics that we have in the Klamasiskis. Again, because the, close, the Klamath coastal areas are so close to the ocean, they have get more rainfall and therefore there's more competition from grasses and other plants, as well as there being less amount of uh, serpentine and especially less amounts of peridotite, which produces a greater diversity of habitat. So very few fens in the coastal area and very few, very little uh, peridotite, which produces the most uh, variation in habitat. Leaves low to the ground and early flowering. Sometimes these things, these uh, adaptations are combined. Uh, now, you don't always want everything to be to the ground. You have to attract insects for pollination. So the flowers may come up uh, uh, higher off the ground, but the leaves, which are losing the most water for the longest amount of time, uh, often are right down on the ground.
And uh, one adaptation has been to evolve uh, plants that are smaller in size because that way they lose less water. And so uh, shrubs of tree genera that no normally are uh, tree size are uh, uh, varieties or uh, actual species are actually uh, much um, uh, lower to the ground or shrub size. So another adaptation for um, most of these though are not uh, specifically endemic to serpentine, but they do tolerate serpentine better than their uh, tree size uh, cousins or ancestors. And also uh, turning into a woody, having a woody base from a herbaceous uh, uh, ancestry uh, also helps reduce uh, water loss. And so sufrutessens uh, applies to two of our uh, endemic species of uh, uh, what looks like herbaceous plant, but their base are actually woody. And so um, as its color is rock crest. So that tends to reduce water and uh, also tends to be more of a perennial habitat which is uh, important for surviving uh, bad years and serpentine of uh, drought. I'm sure you've seen this on several different occasions. The red acts as sunscreen and uh, protecting the plant uh, from the high ultraviolet, the result of the openness of the habitat in which they're colonizing uh, relatively free from competition but also having to deal with uh, the energies of the sun. Blue green leaves also, uh, uh, but instead of absorbing the high energies of, uh, of um, the sun, they actually reflect it. So uh, the blue green is reflecting the most uh, uh, harmful and most energetic of the sun's rays, i.e. In the, into the ultraviolet uh, and um, are common in desert areas or serpentine areas. Um, another adaptation are nickel accumulators. Nickel uh, in some cases tends to be a poisonous plant and, and, um, and certain plants are able to sequester or isolate some of the nickel, reducing its uh, potential harm to the plant. Uh, we have several plants that are accumulators of nickel. Only two species accumulate nickel of the uh, um, uh, jewel flowers, um, but um, there has other adaptations that help it survive the, uh, the drought and the serpentine. Uh, other adaptations, some of uh, uh, these plants exclude magnesium or taking more calcium to try to, to uh, manage that ratio to make it more even. Uh, and so it reduces toxicity in terms of stunning the plant's roots uh, for lack of pectin or uh, cell division. Uh, fens are kind of double bind in terms of uh, they do reduce competition, uh, but it's because of low oxygen and nutrients and toxic ionic balances. So these uh, plants have to um, uh, survive both uh, stresses. And so there are fewer fence species than on drier ultramathics because of the double whammy that it has to contend with both the ionic imbalances as well as the, uh, um, the lack of nutrients because of low oxygen levels, <clears throat> low levels also of phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, there is a way around this uh, and I'll show you later. In fact, uh, the butterwort uh, is uh, doing that as well. Um, so some of these plants we think are, or botanists think are paleoendemics. Uh, they've been around for a lot longer. Uh, one in particular, Darlingtonia, it's in its own genus. And consequently uh, also it has a bug in it, a genera that's related to uh, the same genera, genera in 
of the uh, plants back east, the Saracenia, Saracenopsis. Uh, and as a result, it's thought that, as well as genetics indicate, that it moved in from the uh, Eastern United States from the ancestral Saracenia pitcherwort and um, subsequently evolved in Darlingtonia. And now it's been isolated from Saracenia because of the rise of mountains in the mid uh, Western uh, drought uh, that ensued from the rain shadows produced by the mountains. And so, um, uh, Saras um, the, the plant Saracenia is ancestral to Darlingtonia um, based on the genetics and the relationship of species in the same genus, now separated uh, by thousands of miles, but also has its own uh, endemics, in fact, more endemics than any other plant, uh, certainly any other near endemic plant uh, of the Climacisciscus, especially a herbaceous plant because of the structural complexity of its leaves. Next. Um, it'd be interesting to look at. I don't think it, I'm not sure if anybody's actually looked to see whether uh, the Del Nor uh, willow has its own um, has a structural complexity enough to house uh, uh, native endemic uh, insects. But I don't think anybody's really looked at that in detail to see whether that's the case. But that would be another one. And uh, again, the fact that willows are shrubs or trees in this case, a, a shrub uh, tend to evolve very slowly. And that's one of the reasons why um, botanists think that's probably it's a paleoendemic, even though there's no uh, fossil record of it. Microbial symbionts and old diverse genera may help in colonizing serpentine. Um, and um, uh, one thing that's been looked at only a few cases, uh, we don't know a whole lot about uh, what the resistance is, but we suspect that California lady slipper is an exception to the rule of most orchids not being able to uh, colonize serpentine, most likely because the uh, ionic imbalances and the metals are toxic to its symbionts, its fungal symbionts. And therefore, without its fungal symbionts, the uh, lady slipper can't survive, or the other orchids cannot survive in. Um, in uh, serpentine fins. And hence, uh, it's about the only one uh, with the exception of stream orchid. So having previous adaptations or what's called ex-adaptations -adapta ex uh, probably is helpful based on the number of species that are now endemic uh, to the kind of ciscus in allowing it to um, <clears throat> colonize serpentine because this metabolism allows them to these plants to take in carbon dioxide at night uh, when the humidity is higher, store it as malic acid and release it, uh, convert it back into carbon dioxide during the daytime and keeping their stomates, their leaf holes closed and therefore saving water. So this adaptation succulents also found in cacti is invaluable in living in serpentine or desert areas, hence the number of endemics. Uh, and as, as you can see here, it's not true that when you see them one, you've seen them all. Uh, there's lots of different uh, sedums. Again, the result of their CAM metabolism. Bulbs also are a useful adaptation for a colonizing serpentine uh, for two reasons. One, they can store water, but two, uh, during fires, they can burn to ground or simply die back to the ground uh, during the summer, and but still sprout out uh, quickly in early flowering season uh, in the early spring while still be able to capture the water um, that that time of year affords. Irises are another one that have bulbs uh, that also allowed it to uh, speciate into different parts. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, a lot of plants, I'll show you later, have only a few uh, CRN sites, but they have thousands of uh, sites in the Climacisciscus, suggesting that the uh, diversity, the habitat diversity of the Climacisciscus is much greater 
uh, than the CRN sites, uh, at least in regards to serpentine. Again, onion bulbs are another uh, uh, way. Um, I've included Franciscan serpentine endemic that's not endemic to the climate sensitive use, endemic to uh, near San Francisco. Uh, but again, there's fewer species of endemic serpentine plants on the coastal areas that further down south of the climate sensitive use simply because those exposures are younger and also they're smaller and also they're mostly serpentinite rather than uh, predatite, and therefore consequently have less habitat diversity and higher extinction rates. Many subspecies and varieties apply rapid or ongoing speciation as these things uh, uh, suggest uh, next, just to show you a variety of different um, plants. Um, here's an example of one that's only recently proposed uh, in 2015. Um, and so there's some controversy. It's not accepted by many botanists, but that simply illustrates the fact that what we're seeing here is speciation in process. Things that are a continuum of species, varieties, uh, subspecies, forms, etc. And so the fact that people disagree as to what's a subspecies, what's a variety, et cetera, is simply illustrated the fact that here we're seeing the process unfolding before our eyes. Um, of the, like I said, 254 climate species, uh, uh, close to a third are subspecies, much more than when you look at the flora as a whole. Brumade serpentine demics, uh, again, um, uh, also, we'll talk about more about parasitism it may enable wiser species to live on nutrient poor serpentine. So it may, again, uh, adaptation may enable them to speciate on serpentine uh, with the lack of competition. Next. Um, so neoendemics are, are most likely these plants that have speciated it, so they produce a lots of endemics within the same genus. Um, the suggested, not conclusive, but uh, because they only fossils, but uh, certainly uh, it's most likely scenario as to why there's so many plants in one particular species or one genera that have a, a certain adaptation like the CAM metabolism. Uh, again, another example, uh, as well as um, uh, Porcelia, um, Ivesia, some of these things are only recently diverged, probably the gender from each other. So they're probably along the same ancestral lines, even though they might be different gender now. At one time, they probably were the same, what we call sister uh, species, meaning that they share a common ancestor. Sandworts, as in arena, uh, they used to be called arenaria. Um, now they've been the name has been changed, but again, the, the, it's the same thing that uh, these things uh, probably come from a common ancestor, uh, finding lots of room to speciate, um, and also the stress itself uh, tends to increase speciation um, in these species. Again, phacelias, several different types of phacelias, um, quite different from each other, but again, having the adaptations of being low to the ground and so on. Again, to reiterate the fact that uh, th these species have thousands of sites, or at least hundreds of sites in the Klamasiskus, but less than six known non climasiscus sites, mostly in the Sierras. And that's again, because of greater habitat diversity in, um, in the Klamasiskus, such that when climate change occurs, which always does, 
uh, they're able to migrate more easily to an adjacent habitat that's suitable for them during that climate uh, uh, condition. And so they're able to survive. So the extinctions are low, relatively low compared to like Sierras. There's a greater habitat diversity because of the uh, east-west uh, uh, longitudinal uh, diversity of climates and, uh, and different types of rocks. And as a result, uh, they can survive, but also the, the habitat diversity allows for greater isolation speciation where they're separated from their cousins from some distance and therefore can speciate. So high speciation, high migration, low extinction, the, that's the formula for the high climate cystic diversity in the plants. Another, exa another example of, uh, of climate species, very common, uh, uh, at least some of these are very commonly seen in the climate species. I'm sure you've seen some of these, uh, but they're very rare uh, elsewhere because of lower habitat diversity, which by the way may change as climate changes more quickly. Some plant families in general are poor and several new species, we're not always sure why. For example, astragalus, it may have to do with the uh, interference with uh, fungal symbionts, it may be something else. Again, few orchids on serpentine, I've never seen a phantom orchid illustrated here on serpentine, they, they could occur. But like I said, uh, it could be, uh, uh, since there's so many species of orchids, it's kind of unusual to find so few of them on serpentine. So it could be the result of, um, of, um, <clears throat> of uh, toxicity on the symbionts. Notice the little kernels uh, on the stem are actually vestigial leaves because it doesn't produce the uh, chlorophyll, doesn't uh, it relies on fungal symbionts, um, which is probably why it doesn't occur on serpentine. Um, again, though, if you have families that are uh, diverse themselves and also have fungal symbionts that can tolerate the, the toxicity of the serpentine, then you're going to have a number of different uh, species from those families or genera. Asters are a good example. Asters is one of the largest uh, of uh, all plant families. Uh, considered by, by many botanists as the largest one, um, certainly rivaling orchids. Waldo buckwheat, as here you know where Waldo is uh, near where I live, uh, uh, outside of Cave Junction. Uh, Waldo was one of the first areas to be surveyed. It was the original um, town, uh, the county seat uh, during the Cold Rush era. And so several species were collected there and named after the town. more aster family uh, species. Not all are serpentine endemic, some just favor serpentine. These are all though, I believe all endemics.
Do any of these uh, plants have any special uh, fire adaptations? Yes, uh, for sure. The bulbs uh, are uh, clearly a fire adaptation as well as storing water, but they were able to sprout uh, with the, especially the size of the bulbs in many of the serpentine plants, uh, which is pretty amazing when you consider that uh, uh, there's so little water to draw upon, but most of these uh, bulbs enlarge simply in size during the wet early uh, spring season. Uh, and then and then flower. So uh, that's probably the the most important adaptation is uh, as um, <clears throat> but it, it accords with other adaptations, which is to die back to the ground level uh, to save on water and to survive in your bulb until you can uh, flower uh, leaf out and flower next uh, season. So again, close relationships may help, uh, especially in symbiotic bacteria and peas. Uh, one time I thought it was a problem, but uh, there's enough now. We know enough about endemic uh, or serpentine tolerant uh, peas to, to realize that uh, probably it's not a problem with their symbionts. And then the symbiotic fungi in near endemic like the uh, uh, and it may simply take time for the fungal symbionts uh, to be able to adapt to serpentine. The lady slippers are considered one of the oldest of uh, orchid genera, and so maybe simply had to wait a long time in order to for the uh, symbiont to evolve to be able to tolerate the the uh, low nutrients in the water as well as the toxic uh, calcium magnesium uh, imbalances. So again, age, just like with speciation, age in uh, fungal symbionts may be important. Um, parasitism and hemiparasites, like in uh, paintbrushes, uh, it may be one of the reasons why we tend to have a number of paintbrushes uh, that uh, are able to survive, especially in the wetter areas. But uh, split hair Indian paintbrush actually is in pretty dry areas, as is um, the, um, the Casulea hispida. Um, short lobed um, uh, paintbrush. Uh, other, oh, actually, all three though. So, only the only Siski paintbrush is the only wet one. So, um, parasites probably simply are, are supplying nutrients because both wet and uh, dry uh, serpentine tend to be low in nutrients. So, if you're a parasite, you, you have a pre adaptation or ex adaptation in order to colonize uh, serpentinites and serpentine uh, mineral uh, soils. Uh, carnivorous plants and fens are also, as I'm sure you know, about Darringtonia uh, and also butterwort. But interesting, the last few years, there's been a new study done on bog asphodel, which grows in serpentine wet areas. And it turns out that uh, it is a carnivorous plant too. It's a sticky plant, sticky stem plant, really thought to deter insects. However, um, it turns out that the, uh, the sap or the, the resins that the plant produces has a, an enzyme called phosphatase, which uh, breaks down uh, the uh, phosphorus in dead insects caught on the stems and then nourishes the plant. Um, uh, it was also thought maybe catch flies, which are common on serpentine, uh, were also um, carnivorous plants, but it doesn't have enzyme probably just a deterrence for nectar thieves to deter nectar thieves. But uh, bog asphodel now has joined the list of serpentine carbonivorous plants and fins. So we don't think that uh, catchflies are, are carnivores, at least right now, but uh, uh, you never know. It may, more, more studies may come out with some, at least one species or two might be carnivorous, but simply because they haven't been looked at in much detail, only a few species. And so uh, we're not, uh, we're making generalizations or abundant make generalizations that may not be true. Each plant is unique and may have its own unique characteristics, carnivorous or otherwise. So that's one of the reasons why we have such high endemics is that endemics of serpentine tend to be poor migrants. 
uh, especially long distance migrants. And so they may be able to move to an adjacent uh, habitat that's more suitable for it during climate change, but long distance travel um, is only a species that are not endemic, such as uh, Indian dream that uh, uh, Fan Aspidosis, the fern, uh, that also is found in Newfoundland, uh, way back uh, thousands of miles on the East Coast area. At, um, they're the same species because uh, they're not endemic, simply because uh, spores tend to float through the uh, air and therefore dilute any mutations that uh, may occur in each of the areas. So uh, having big seeds, which you want to have if you're an endemic, certainly endemic to survive the early season for your drought, you don't may not have the symbiotic relationships that uh, mother trees have, for example, in nursing their seedlings. <laughs> um, endemics also may have originated in here, uh, some of the genera, so for example, brook trillium, maybe earth's earliest trillium, it's a, a serpentine endemic, uh, mostly in Illinois Valley, but a little further north, south. Um, it, uh, for example, it stopped by one of the, uh, the Klamath River uh, from going, uh, or I'm sorry, the Illinois River from going further north, uh, just because it, the seeds are big and can't travel very well in water. Um, Del Norte County Island may be one of the earliest of an Irish group, not the whole genera. Next. Um, this may be begun in the California Thurstic uh, province, since that's where the highest diversity is. It may have even uh, begun in the Klamath as well. But uh, um, the Calicordus, though, is um, Calicordus next is um, uh, much more likely to have begun than Clamacis is because by far its greatest diversity is in the uh, Clamacisques uh, uh, over, um, I think, uh, something like 70% uh, of all uh, uh, Calicordises are found in the Clamacisques, many of them which are endemic to that including our own uh, Calicordus huelii uh, near uh, Cave Junction. Another uh, that might be a, a originator uh, here of this particular huelanthus uh, offshoot of uh, uh, older uh, genera. Stingia, like the Calicordus, is another uh, genera whose most species are occur in the Clamacisque, so um, it may have originated here as well. Some, though, evolved uh, after the supercontinent, but uh, we do have some that have become endemics uh, within uh, the Clamacisque, but probably did not originate here. Another uh, Klamath uh, uh, serpentine endemic, uh, which is an own family suggesting long period isolation from cousins in Asia. Um, in fact, it's been, they evolved so differently that they're now put in different families, whereas once they were in the same family. Another migration from Europe again. The, the Clamacisius are at the, the forefront of migration pathways. We're the only mountain systems in the, in the uh, United States that's connected to several other mountain ranges, the Sierras, the Cascades, and the coastal ranges of California, and as also connected to migrations from Asia, from Europe, and also from South America once it joined North America. As you might imagine, <clears throat> Asia is the real powerhouse of uh, diversity in terms of migrating species to the US or to North America, uh, simply because it's the largest and therefore has the greatest diversity habitats, even more so than North America. Uh, 
One of my favorite is Siskiyou Inside Out flower. Um, again, we can look from genetics, look at uh, Susskind speciation, yielding species of, um, and um, clearly uh, derived from an earlier uh, epimedium from Asia based on genetics. Willow herbs, again, we have a, a very high diversity of willow herbs, both endemics and non-endemics in the climate species. Uh, <clears throat> as far as I know, no study has been done to look at the genetic origin of epilobium, but uh, certainly it's some of them speciated here. Uh, species produced by polyploids are common here. Um, relatively common with doubling of chromosomes uh, leads an increase in phacelias and uh, uh, bitter crests and so on. And ecological drivers like uh, new niches uh, like serpentine can stabilize these polyploids so they become actually new species. Um, <clears throat> hybrids that you can easily see, uh, certainly the top one, Calicordis at the uh, uh, house uh, uh, serpentine fen uh, is a great example of hybridization, wet and dry uh, serpentine uh, uh, producing an intermediate hairy, but, uh, um, um, but pink. More hybrids. This is a hybrid I mentioned earlier that uh, is uh, found near Mount, on Mount Preston and near Mount Preston on uh, uh, Roughback uh, Ridge. Um, and as a result, um, it only produces a hybrid, not a new species most likely because it's relatively recent uh, mountain uplift and consequently has not time to speciate. But eventually, given enough millions of years, uh, we may produce a new uh, species out of the hybrids of two older species. And uh, trying to top everything off, um, these are some of the species associated with uh, serpentine plants. Uh, this is a serpentine ecology, so we should clue animals too. Uh, however, we know very little about uh, the animals. These are simply animals associated with, uh, with species only generally only found on um, serpentine. A uh, few of the plants uh, are, uh, I'm sorry, um, this one, these are species only found on Darlingtonia. So um, given the number of species, even with the structural complexity, there surely must be more species uh, elsewhere that we simply haven't discovered. So consider this, that uh, Darlingtonia for a herbaceous plant has more species obligates only found in it uh, than uh, as far as I know, any other herbaceous plant in the entire planet. And that's because of the structural complexity of its leaves, um, which uh, allows uh, animals to hide from predators, that sort of thing. Uh, so probably some of the herbaceous or the shrubby uh, serpentine plants like Del Norte Willow probably have their own obligates or may have their own obligates uh, only found on the willow, but nobody's really looked for that. These are plants or animals that are associated with, um, that feed on serpentine plants. They're not necessarily obligate to those serpentine plants, with the exception of two of the gall wasps, which are unidentified gall wasps, but they've produced um, galls, distinctive galls on plants, one of which um, at the, um, located at, um, um, Kangaroo Lake uh, probably is on an obligate uh, or a serpentine plant, uh, uh, the um, Huckleberry, uh, <clears throat> um, Huckleberry Oak, 
uh, the other one uh, may be on a serpentine plant. So uh, other than that, though, most of these plants are either found in the climacescues on serpentine plants or are themselves endemic to like the, uh, especially the lichens. Um, the moss are, uh, and butterfly are feeders of serpentine plants as larvae. So that, uh, I think that pretty much concludes uh, my program. Um, like I said, uh, there's not much in the way of plants or ways of animals, and surely there must be a lot more, but we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what servitine ecology really means for here as well as elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Well, we have some time for questions. Um, the first question here is in the chat box. Okay. And Alisa is asking, let me pull up the question. She's asking about um, hybridization. Is this area I guess you're speaking of Elisa um, here in Southern Oregon, the Klamath Siskiyous. Is this area um, known for its hybridiz hybridization than anywhere else? Uh, the answer is, I believe so, uh, but I don't have actually the numbers to look at that in particular. Um, so I would have to go back to my master list to actually sort that out. But uh, I don't remember. All I remember is that definitely they're higher uh, than they are elsewhere, uh, at least on uh, the Klamath uh, Siskiyous area. Um, and the reason for that simply is the number of serpentine areas. There's so many different serpentine areas. And because of the density of the habitats, well, the highest density of habitats on the entire planet is that they're often close together. And so that's where you have two habitats that are similar, relatively close together, where they exchange genetic material. That's where you're most likely to get hybrids, and especially hybrids that are going to be viable, because as I mentioned before, hybrids are uh, may uh, reject uh, pollen, uh, not fertilize or abort the seeds if the pollen comes from a uh, non serpentine plant. So if you have two serpentine areas close by, they're much more likely to hybridize than if they're, the serpentine is isolated from one another. So Interesting. Okay. So would that, so would the lupin be a good example of that? Say a lupin growing up in the siskiyous versus a lupin growing in serpentine? They're not going to. I'm trying to think, I don't think there's actually any lupins that are uh, hybrids. Um, the, I'm thinking more of the Louisia, um, uh, the Calicordis, the Mariposa lilies, um, uh, and um, a whole host of other plants, but I really don't think there's any lupins. Um, one also th uh, thing interesting is some plants uh, that appear to be hybrids, like uh, one of the Erythronium trout lilies, uh, is a, a hybrid between two plants that are actually uh, different, uh, segregated by different elevations. So mm. what may have happened actually is there may have been recent uplift that brought the, the, the two uh, populations together. And one of the populations now is extinct or both of the parents may now be extinct in that particular area, but we end up with hybrids. And that, there's a plant, uh, a calicordis in uh, at Oregon Caves that may fit that bill. So you can have recent uplift, but it may increase their ability to have hybrids uh, in which the survivor or the, the only survivor is a hybrid and the parents in that particular area are gone. Very interesting. I had a question for you, John. You mentioned stress causes an increase in, speciation, in speciation. What environmental stresses in particular were you referring to? Was it climate change? Uh, drought and the, um, also the calcium magnesium ratios and also the toxic metals, particularly zinc uh, uh, and also nickel. 
uh, Nichols are kind of interesting. <laughs> it's actually named after Saint Nick uh, or Old Nick, which is a euphemism for the devil because uh, miners in your Germany thought that the, the devil placed that nickel on top of other ores, more valuable ores, but they could not, in those days, in late medieval time, had this smelting that could isolate nickel and use it as a metal. Um, and so they thought that the devil simply put it there to bedivel them, if I can allow that pun. pun. Um, also, actually interesting, nickel is also now thought to be the main cause of the end Permian extinction, in which nickel from erupting volcanoes uh, not only produced methane from going through coal, but also fertilized the oceans massively, ending up with an algal and microbial bloom that turned all the oceans into a dead zone uh, and therefore mm. wiped out more than 90% of all species, uh, at least in the oceans, until the point where the anaerobic bacteria rose to the surface of the oceans, emitted hydrogen sulfide, which in our lungs turned to, or into the lungs of animals turned into uh, sulfuric acid. Anyway, um, uh, so nickel is a toxic and it, it, its history goes back a long ways. Um, so those are the stresses. Uh, we're not sure what uh, are, causes the speech agent, but all we do know is that various types of stresses does initiate speech agent. Exactly why that is probably has to do with an increase in mutation rate. That's the most logical mm -hmm. or what the hypothesis is right now. And so all uh -huh. those things, However, beyond a certain stress, uh, the plants may become extinct or at least extirpated. For example, uh, Susan Harrison and her work on uh, serpentine plants mm -hmm. here uh, found that the serpentine plants are actually at their limit of physiological drought resistance. That if we have further climate change, mm. we'll lose some populations. We we'll probably won't lose all of them simply because of our diversity of habitat and the fact that we've mm -hmm. already gone through an early Holocene, uh, you know, 10,000 years or so ago, a much hotter time than even now, and, and they still survive. So most of them certainly uh, originate before that time. And so, uh, but we'll probably lose some species simply because they're at their limit right now, uh, which was a surprising fact. Fascinating, fight. lots to chew on there. Um, we have a few more questions. This one's from Matt. Can you recommend a good resource for mapping of local geology or mineral deposits? For mapping I don't know if you want to give that information uh, out. <laughs> um, if I can send you and you can send on to Matt uh, my email and I can send him some information, but the probably okay. the most important one for local geology would be to you to go to Oregon Geologic Map. Oregon now has a full uh, interactive map that you can look at extremely deep areas throughout Oregon and, uh, and, um, and uh, see what the local geology. It's a little difficult to use because the roads and, and cities and stuff are not well located on that. So it takes a little while, but if you're in a particular area, you can zero out using other maps to to uh, to find your your way in that. So uh, um, the the Oregon geology map. Uh, there's also some interesting books in terms of local uh, geology and regional geology, especially regional geology. Oregon. Uh, one I recommend is Oregon Rocks. Uh, the same author as Roadside Geology of Oregon, um, uh, and which is also a good book and relatively recent. So those two books I recommend in terms of your interest in geology. Thank you, John. Uh, we have I, another uh, question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I can, I can uh, take a look at the answers. Do you think the effects of multi-year drought will be on these specialized plant communities? Sorry, sorry to mention that is that, uh, however, we don't know, we don't have enough detail to know um, exactly how severe the droughts were in the early Holocene. So we really can't say, as it looks right now, with the current projections, at least to the end of the century, uh, probably most of the plant species will survive. Um, uh, Multi-year droughts that were similar to what, but the, beyond that, we don't really know because at that point we're sort of in whole new territory in terms of uh, millennial droughts. 
mm -hmm. with no analog from the, by the way, we do have some very good data on climate, uh, both from Oregon case, stalagmites and stalactites, especially stalagmites, as well as work done by uh, Christy Brills on uh, lakes, uh, pollen and fire and so on that are local alert rates. So it gives you a feeling for what's happened last at least 25,000 years. And then I think we have one more there from Elisa, if you can see that, John, in the chat box. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot more harmonization there in other areas of the world. Um, I think there is, but I don't know. I don't have, I haven't done that comparison. Um, I've been, like I said, uh, all around the United States in terms of working national parks and interest in all the botany. I've never seen the amount of hybridization in all those areas that I've seen here, um, but it had to be a, a more comprehensive look at uh, the total flora uh, to look at the hybrids. Um, and again, I can send the, the whole list, uh, which is 2,000 pages of uh, species or just the uh, plant list. And uh, you would simply could go through uh, them and do a word search for X, which is going to be your hybrids, at least ones that have produced new species, um, and uh, figure out that number. But I have, right now, I have nothing really to compare it to uh, quantitatively. And we have one okay. more there. Yes. Okay. The Ingos, uh, Washington State, are there similar specialized plant genera that occur in both areas? Uh, the answer is they're similar, but there's much fewer uh, in the Ingos. I'm not sure if there's actually any actual obligates, in other words, only found in serpentine there uh, in the Ingos. Number one is it's much smaller area, and also it's been more serpentinized and therefore lower diversity, much less pritotite than occurs. But that does uh, example, gives it a good example of the fact that those were probably the same uh, ophiolite, same seafloor, and the collision was so great uh, and the crustal shortening was so great that parts of the seafloor got spewed or routed all the way up to Washington. So it's, uh, we, wow. you almost never find that in geology, uh, such a, a huge collision. The only place that we find that in geology generally are where you have continent to continent collisions, like the Himalayas impacting Asia or Africa hitting Europe, closing off the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, this is very unusual. So that's a whole nother uh, project or whole another session as to why we have such unusual one. But the end result of those crustal shortenings is it's like like squeezing an ice cube uh, closer together so that it rides higher in the water. By squeezing the light low density uh, crust together, it rises up and also buoys up the very dense uh, prototype. And consequently, that's why we have so much prototype. Whereas other areas like the Sierras that didn't occur, the same timing sequence, and therefore that thing, those that the equivalent age of uh, serpentinite uh, in the Sierra is apparently sunk mostly in, back into the mantle and was reabsorbed. And so uh, we were saved by this low density material, including the silts uh, blown in from the in Permian continents. Fascinating. Thank you, John. That seems to be a wrap on questions. So I just want to thank you again, John, and for all of our attendees this evening. Um, I'll send around a follow up email and there'll be um, a recording of this and there'll also be um, a comment um, form. So if y'all have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to check out our last webinar series coming up next month in September. So don't miss that. And again, thank you so much, John. Do you have any final words? Well, we'll mention one thing that uh, I think I mentioned a little bit about it, and that is uh, that about uh, ecology versus evolution is that we, your Americans, especially back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, 
uh, whether in British Columbia or United States, uh, are much more interested in competition and also the har horizontal extent. Uh, and therefore they treated the, the, uh, um, the forest as a flat floor, the ground was the most important. So they herbicide plants in British Columbia, especially and so on, uh, without realizing of course that you have to take into account the vertical, the evolution, the indigenous uh, realization that the ground, the, the earth is more than the ground. The earth includes the air we breathe, includes the fungi underground and so on. So by integrating this and the two books I highly recommend and understanding the link between the new sciences of the vertical and evolution and indigenous knowledge is to uh, one called Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Shimard, Finding the Mother Tree and also uh, Braiding Sweetgrass by Kim Rur. Oh yes. Uh, they're both great books that unite science and indigenous knowledge and realize that they knew it all along <laughs> in terms of uh, understanding how the world works, which is what science is all about. Well, I'm going to leave it right there. Thank you so much, John. And I wish everyone a great evening. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.